stop for now, but don't advance it to the next one because I'd like to bring it up at the end of the sermon. Um, some of you will be glad to note that I do have my watch on today. I forgot my glasses, but I got my watch, and many would say that it's much more important for me to have my watch than my glasses. So there you go. Uh, yeah, all in favor. I want, want, want to start by telling you a story. Some of you will have heard this before, um, and it's going to sound totally disconnected from any reality uh, to do with sermoning and preaching and all the rest of it, and it will uh, until I make the connection, so bear with me. Uh, some of you might remember me saying in various sermons that a long, long time ago, um, way before Mer, uh, while I was in seminary, I, I was dating a girl who was a classic Connecticut Yankee, and her sister owned a dairy farm in upstate New York. Some of you are nodding. Okay, so you remember. Uh, her sister's name was Judy, married to a guy named Dennis. I learned an awful lot about dairy farming from, from Dennis. Uh, I also learned some other interesting things. Uh, he was a Vietnam vet, and uh, uh, I, I, I heard a fair bit about his experience in Vietnam from him, a son that was very, very difficult. Uh, I saw some in, incredible things that, like, that just boggled my mind. One of the things, and the image sticks with me to this day, uh, it, as I said, it was a dairy farm, and they have a at a dairy farm. You have a bulk tank where all the milk goes, you know, uh, and and it's it, it was 800 gallons, and um, accidentally one day one of the cows that had mastitis, their milk ended up in the bulk tank, and so 800 gallons of milk literally had to be flushed down the drain, and I was thinking, my God, you know what an unbelievable waste just to watch this. You know what it's like when you see people emptying their swimming pools at the end of the year? That's what it was like, except it was milk. Oh, that broke my heart. Uh, I also had another experience. I'm not sure if I've ever told you about this one, but um, they, they weren't rich, Dennis and Judy. They were really nice people. Well, they weren't rich. And um, when the gutter cleaner broke down in the barn, they didn't have enough money to replace it. Do you know what a gutter cleaner is? Behind where the cows stand, like the cow's head is in a stanchion, so they can't move. They can just eat out of the, out of the trough, uh, but they can't move. Uh, so then they're on a cement platform, and then behind the cow is a gutter for the obvious reason. And the gutter cleaner is like a conveyor belt with sort of blades on it that just sort of, just sort of keeps going when you push the button. And when you drive by these farms in eastern townships and Laurentians and stuff, and they got these big piles of manure outside, that's what happens when you clean the gutter. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, their gutter cleaner was broken, and um, so it had to all be done by hand. I love this story. It's just funny. Um, and uh, I was young and strong in those days, so Dennis asked me to clean out the gutter. Well, basically, he just told me that I was cleaning out the gutter, and so I did. And so we backed the tractor uh, with the trailer um, behind it. Uh, and this trailer was about 12 feet wide and 16 feet long, and it too had blades, so that after you got the manure from the gutter in the bed of the trailer, you could drive out into the field, turn on the impeller, the impeller was like blades, and it would spread the manure. It was called a manure spreader. So I'm loading up the manure spreader. Two tons, okay, two tons. Dennis is just teaching me how to drive a tractor. So after I have loaded up the two tons of manure, I get in the driver's seat of the tractor. Dennis is nowhere to be found because he's sort of left his slave to do the work. Um, and I start up the tractor without realizing that the impeller for the manure spreader is already engaged. Inside the barn. Did you lose your job? Well, no, but... You know what happens when it hits the fan, right? I learned a lesson that day. Cleaning two tons of manure off the wall, ceiling, hay, everything else, is a lot harder than cleaning it out of a gutter. So that was one story. The very next day, I went to church. God, did I need to go to church. It was a United Methodist Church in a, in a town called Ogdensburg, New York. And it was a typical, I guess you would say, small town church. It was, it was like clapboard, um, no hall attached, it was just a church, and 
it was all farmers, you know, so people weren't dressed like, I was used to seeing people dressed in church. They were dressed in, you know, work clothes and, and the place smelled like a barn every, every, everywhere I went, you know. Um, I think as long as I was dating Chris, I smelled like a barn. Um, actually, one time I, did, I came home from a weekend at Judy and Dennis's, and people at the seminary kind of avoided me for a while. Um, but so went into this church, and uh, there's very few sermons that I remember in my life. Um, but the sermon that I heard that day is just in, engraved in, in, in my memory. Uh, not the whole sermon, but, but part of it. Because it was so good. It was so perfect. It was so contextual. You know, the preacher used an image that would connect very, very quickly and easily. See, another thing Dennis had taught me was how to shoot a gun. I never shot a real firearm uh, in, in my life. Um, but he taught me how to shoot. Uh, I was pretty good, too. Kind of proud of that. Um, but he taught me how to shoot. And so this image that the minister used that Sunday... Uh, connected with me in a way that it wouldn't have 48 hours previously. Um, and what he said was, you know, Jesus came to give us freedom and life and joy and love. And he says, the worst thing in church is, you know, you can be straight as a gun barrel and just as cold and hard when you're a Christian. And then he developed that theme. How so often in the church, we're so worried about getting it right and what the it is at any moment can, can, can change. We're so worried about getting it right that we become straight as gun barrels and just as cold and hard. And isn't it true in our lives, in our daily lives, when we go through a time of confusion or uncertainty or doubt or struggle, or pain, or transition. You know, all those things that sort of push the scramble button. Our tendency is not to look to the joy and freedom and peace that Christ offers, but our tendency is to tighten the parameters and to take control. Isn't that what we do as human beings? And I would suggest that often as Christians we do the same thing. Um, we become straight as gun barrels and just as cold and hard. Uh, all with good intent, you know, all intending to serve God. Um, but what ends up happening is the church ends up being a place that is the opposite of a place where people can find liberation. It becomes a jail for spirits as opposed to a place of liberated spirits. And, and you really don't need to look any further than the gospel today, uh, today's gospel, for an example of how that worked itself out in, in, in Jesus' time. Uh, famous story. The Pharisees are there, the religious ones, uh, the church people of Jesus' day, and they're trying to trap him. I wonder, like I, I really wonder, I'm not just saying this like speculatively because it's good to put in a sermon, but I really wonder when they saw Jesus in the streets at the River Jordan doing the things that he did, I wonder if they got any sense at all that this guy was holy. I wonder if they got a sense of Jesus' holiness at all uh, because maybe their minds were just so clouded, so blinded by their preconceptions as to what religion was than what righteousness was that they just couldn't even see his holiness. You know? Uh, I suspect for at least some that was the case. So Jesus is doing what Jesus does, but he's not recognized certainly as, well, on this occasion as a holy man. And what they try to do is, of course, they try to trap him. And they try to trap him in something that really has, has a great deal to say to our, to our, our time and our society. Uh, divorce laws, you know. And in Jesus' time, if a man said about his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Say, I divorce you three times, 
you're divorced. Now, it was not a welfare state. And so what that would have the effect of doing is she would become an untouchable, as, as you know, um, and she's got a couple of options. You know, one was uh, she could go, if, there, if, if, if it was possible, to the temple and for the rest of her life basically put herself into, the only way to say it is indentured servitude as a cleaner of the temple. She could do that, possibly. Or she could become a prostitute, you know. And uh, apparently there was a great call for prostitutes in Jesus' day, still is apparently. Um, and, and so to just pronounce divorce like that in a society where there is no protection uh, is to condemn a woman to that life. And Jesus on several occasions has some very interesting things to say to people who would condemn women to that kind of life. But they're trying to trap him. And what he does is something really fascinating. I'm not going to get Richard to read the gospel again, but you read it. And what you'll see is he makes the rules for divorce for men the same as the rules for divorce for women. The rules for divorce for women the same as the rules for divorce for men. You know, On, on, on another occasion in the Bible, uh, we read God with vehemence, you know, announcing that he hates divorce. You know, uh, why? You know, it's just the ending of a relationship. Relationships end all the time. Why does God hate divorce? In the particular context, it's because divorce damaged gave no life options for women. So it was really a pro-female statement. When God says, I hate divorce, it was a pro-female statement. I wonder if the people in Jesus' time heard that. I wonder if they were capable of hearing that. I wonder if the religious church people were capable of hearing Jesus' admonitions to practice social justice. Now, I could go on here like for, for a couple of hours, you know, and bring out all those, all those points in scripture where Jesus talks about social justice, you know, and how the rich are supposed to treat the poor the story of the rich man and Lazarus and, you know, the, the wrong person is in heaven. And, you know, I have a funny feeling that in that story, God is saying, I just don't know how to get through to you. Because the story comes pretty close to an end where the rich man says, look, please, please go tell all my relatives so that they don't end up in hell like me. And the word is, look, if they haven't listened to the law and the prophets, they're not going to listen, even if someone rises from the dead. So I suspect there is this thing, because all of this stuff is addressed to religious people, eh? That there is something about religiousness where one can use it to become blind to the will of God rather than to see the will of God 2020. And then to translate that into our day and age, I wonder, you know, we would all like to think that if Jesus was to materialize right now, you know, let's, let's, let's not say second coming in all the glory with the trumpets and fanfare and all that. That's, that's just an image. Let's say Jesus just appeared and walked through St. Mary's door and joined us for worship. He might say, people in the back come to the front, come closer together, and let's go to the kitchen with the kids and make pretzels with them and have a little bit of liturgy in the context of baking pretzels. He might say that, but we'd all like to think that Jesus would come into St. Mary's and think, you know what, you guys, you guys are doing pretty good. You're, you're, you're doing pretty good. You're not too smug about your religiousness. I don't think we are. Do you think we are smug about our how good we are at this Christianity thing. Um, don't think you're too full of self-righteousness. Oh, every now and then you can feel a little self-righteous when you eat a salad instead of McDonald's, you know. But your self-righteousness in, in religious things, oh, you're not too self-righteous. You're not too smug. You're not too self-righteous. 
you're, you're, you're doing okay. And when you sing those songs, you mean them. You, you mean them. Um, you may be a little tight emotionally and need to loosen up, but you mean them. You mean them from the heart. And I, I think Jesus would, would, would say that about St. Mary's. I think he would. I think he would say that um, you, you got some, we got some things right, you know. Uh, if he had a soccer ball, I think he'd put it in the box and be pretty happy about that box of soccer balls uh, going to Africa. And uh, there's a box of socks underneath the table in the hallway um, that's getting more and more and more socks. Um, and I don't know if Jesus would bring socks, but I think he'd look at the socks and he would know that while the socks are a good thing in and of themselves, the socks represent an awareness at St. Mary's that is more than just one or two people. Because by the time that, you know, the socks go down to St. Michael's, there's going to be a few hundred pairs of socks, you know. So it's more than just one or two people who are into socks, you know, or into mission. Um, and he'd, he'd, he'd look at us, I think he'd say, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, I think that Jesus would enjoy being at St. Mary's most of the time. He might not like all aspects of our meetings, um, but then again, he is divine, so he shouldn't. Um, but, I, but I think Jesus would, would pretty much like St. Mary's. I think, I think he would. So we got that part good. But let me ask you this. When you think of Jesus, would you think of him marching in the pride parade in downtown Montreal? How do you feel about a Jesus who would march in the pride parade? And how would you feel about a Jesus who would look at a person and not really have a whole lot to say about who they're with? But he'd be concerned about why they're with them. That, that's my Jesus. I gotta tell you, that's, that's my Jesus. When, when you look at the story of the woman taken in adultery, caught in the very act, Jesus doesn't have a whole lot to say about her being with that particular man. That's not his concern. That's not his concern at all. The religious people are saying, aha, we can stone her to death and nail him at the same time. Jesus, what should we do? And Jesus is there, and he doesn't give them a long dissertation about where people's genitals belong. He doesn't really care at that particular occasion. What he says is, let any one of you who doesn't have that sin be the one to cast the first stone. So just, just imagine what's gone on. They've dug the hole. They've stuck the woman in the hole up to the chest or the shoulders, filled in the hole so she can't move, and they're ready there with the rocks. They're ready there with the rocks. Jesus says, let those of you without this sin. And that's the way this, the story is written, not without sin, without this sin. It's more particular. Um, be the first one to cast a rock. And they all drop their stones. And after a while, he, he looks up. You know, obviously he is a master of timing and he looks at the woman and says, uh, where is everybody? And she looks around. God, can you imagine what, it, what, what was, can you imagine how raw she was emotionally at that particular moment? I, I, I don't know if we could even come close to conceptualizing it, but how raw she was at that moment. But nobody is there. The rocks are there, but they're on the ground. And there's nobody left to throw them. And she said, they, they've all gone, they've all gone. Uh, where are your accusers? My accusers, can you imagine? All your accusers in life, those who have told you that you're no good, that you're weak, that you're feeble, um, that you'll never amount to anything, that you're too tall, too short, too fat, too thin, not rich enough, too rich, 
all those people in your life that told, have told you how many ways you're blowing it. Your accusers. With Jesus right next to you, you look around and all your accusers are gone. And then Jesus says, well, I, I'm not accusing you either. I'm not accusing you either. And then he says something else, and I translate loosely. Uh, but hey, just don't do it anymore. Uh, he's talking about the prostitution side of things. Don't, don't do it anymore. And you know, I have a feeling that when he was saying that, it certainly wasn't because he was against sex, you know. Um, wasn't, he didn't say anything about that particular relationship she had with that guy. No, his concern is much more, much more for her because he knew that what she was doing, forget breaking the law, forget that God had never seen that before and he was being shocked. He knew she was hurting herself, you know? And that's why he told her to stop. Stop doing it because you're hurting yourself. That's what God's concern is for us. You know, once we get past the future of the building and uh, doesn't the column with its new bricks outside look really nice and um, paying the bills and our suitcases for Africa and our concert coming up and all that. Once you get past all of that stuff, important though it is in its own way, what it comes down to is Jesus saying to each of us, amongst many other things, just all that stuff that you're doing to yourself, that you're hurting yourself, don't, don't do that anymore. This is time for you to get back to the piano, okay? Um, uh, stop hurting yourself. When, 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 when you look in the mirror, um, you're looking at a creation of God. You're looking at something absolutely glorious, you know, and, and, and unique. I once said to a youth group member, and she hadn't heard anything like this before, so it really, like, I was amazed at how much, I said, like, you know, no matter how many billions of years go by, no matter how many galaxies there are, and how many billions upon billions of stars, you know, there are, no matter how many times the Earth goes around the sun, no matter how long this planet lasts, no matter how long humanity lasts on this planet, there is only one you. And there will never be anyone like you again. You are totally and absolutely unique in the whole of God's creation and special. And she never seen herself that way before. She saw herself for the first time, I guess you'd have to say, as like, a sanctuary. Oh, so some of this might take on a bit, of, bit more context. Um, Jesus says, look, people, and let's face it, he said this to the thieves, and the zealots, and the violent, and the adulterers, and the fornicators, and all the other people, uh, typical normal people. He says, you know what, You're, you are temples of the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, when you become straight as a gun barrel, you're going to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not what he said. He said, you're temples of the Holy Spirit. Each one of us sitting in this room, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right now, as good as you are and as bad as you are, with all the grace that you hold within you and the capacity for love and generosity and sharing, and with all the selfishness and meanness of spirit and everything else that we all possess. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit right now. I um, was thinking about that song. Could you put it up again, Rich, because we're going to sing it again? Make me a sanctuary. And I was thinking that it would be nice if, if we made this sort of like a a, a, a meditation piece for, for our whole lives, you know, 
not just a piece of music that we like on Sunday, good though that is. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if at the end of each day we were to, you know, turn the lights on, close the curtain, because the day is ending and the night is, is drawing near. Um, if we were to let the burdens of the day go and to take our rest and to just let, let, let things be. Just, 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 just let it be. Just let everything go to God and to just open up ourselves. Um, to be more of a sanctuary. So I'm going to try something with you now. I hope this works. Um, it, it may not, it may be a dismal failure. But I turned that thought into a verse. And you guys are really good. You know, you've got sharp brains, so you'll be able to memorize it. So see if you can sing this. We're going to sing it. And see if you can play the background just a, a, a little bit more. Okay? So the first line is going to be to this tune turn the lights on, close the curtains. Okay? So turn, turn the lights on, close the curtains. Day is ending, night draws near, day is done. Take your rest now, let it be, oh let it be. How do you like that? Do you think that's useful as a way of setting up into it? Okay, so let's see if we can do it together. Sing that twice, and then we'll sing that twice, and then that's the end of the sermon. Okay? Turn the lights on, close the curtains, day is ending. Night draws near. Night draws near. Day is ending. Day is over. Take your rest. I'm trying to think of you and the. Christian that is straight as a gun barrel, but just as cold and hard, but to be soft and malleable. And the way we become that way is to surrender to God at the end of every day and to invite God in to soften our heart. Amen. And now I think it's time to pray. Am I right? Let's pray. So God, God, as we gather here this morning, um, and, and think on a Savior who sees us just as we are, 
and who spoke to very ordinary people, broken, sinful people just like us, and said, you are temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we want our temples to be better than they are uh, while accepting that. We pray for your transforming grace. It's hard to imagine how you see us because we know it's so much better than we see ourselves. Turn us into what you want us to be. Transform us, change us, strengthen us, give us courage, whatever it is that, that needs to happen. Heal us from the wounds of the past because so often our self-image has been determined by people in our past who've damaged us. So stand as a, as, a, as a guard between us and them. In our mind's eye, help us to see you as in the most difficult times of our life, you standing right beside us. And as people told us lies about ourselves, you say, that's not the truth. That's not who you are. That's not the way you are. That's not what you are to be. You are a glorious creation. Something marvelous and unique and precious in the eyes of your Heavenly Father. And God, we pray that through us and through many others, that message would go out into the world. To transform it. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, quite appropriately after that, the peace of the Lord will always be with you.